Settle in class and happy Halloween! Today we've got a whole little adventure to throw your party on, or maybe just do a one-shot with. It was designed around my level 5 party, but I'll let you know how to adjust it for higher and lower levels as we go on. And once we're done, I'll have advice on how to modify it for a mystery. And while I've got a chock full of custom monsters, I'll be sure to give alternatives in case you're running out of a monster manual or you find it easier for your virtual tabletop. But however you slice it, it's time to dive in! The party left at dawn, sent by the Countess to investigate a small fishing village. She usually ignored bell omens from fisher folk, but rumors of strange figures watching from the trees had put her merchants on edge, and she would not stand for a loss in trade. The scout had been insisting that something did not feel right. They laughed, but stayed alert. Guck was paranoid, but he was right more often than they'd like to admit. In the afternoon, the monk broke the uneasy silence. Why is the tide still coming in? Shouldn't that have stopped hours ago? I told you, I told you, something's wrong. Picking up the pace, the town appeared on the horizon in front of them as the sun approached the shoreline beside. Entering a roadside tavern to hunt for information, they find it empty save for some heavy footsteps in a far room. Empty at this hour? That was not good. They hadn't realized the rogue had vanished until they heard his panicked screams, accompanied by a roar. Bursting into the kitchen from behind the bar, they find the kobold sneak attack and not finished what appeared to be a diseased owl bear? Wait, no, not disease. Chitin? Fight number one, inside this small kitchen is an owl bear. Shocker, right? Almost as shocking as the crab shell on it. Yeah, that's their introduction to the theme of this area. Carcinization, or become crab. You clicked a video about a crab cult after all. The important part is that creatures who undergo this process gain plus 2 AC from natural armor, a swim speed, and the amphibious trait. You can also give them a grapple effect if you want, but I excluded that part for the bears. Two of them, the other one thunders out of a different room at the end of round one. If your party's a lower level, use brown bear stats and flavor it as a young one, or swap them for a different beast. You can also add a few young if you need this to be stronger, but for Vasuki the monk, Guck the rogue, Amelia the wizard, and Drak the sorcerer, two owlbear work just fine. Especially for Drak, who immediately began to butcher and roast the meat. They knew there was no stopping him, so Vasuki and Amelia poured themselves a glass. I guess two animals weren't enough. Leave it to a wizard to shove even more in. Uh, uh, no offense, Amelia. I don't think there's a wizard who could do that anymore. It might be Faye. Well, whatever it is, I guess you're right this- Oh god, where's Guck? She was answered by a high-pitched shrieking. Guck was jittering in place at the bottom of a cabinet, menacing a terrified gnome child on top of it. Amelia attempted to soothe her, but even with Guck forcibly ejected, it was slow going. Time didn't seem to be on their side, so a quick spell got the needed information. Her parents and the customers were removed by a group in robes whose footsteps clicked. Her mom hid her on the cabinet to keep her safe from their pets while she was taken. She scribbled a little map of the town and they discussed the relevant locations over dinner. The fish market, the watchtower, and the chapel seemed like the best places to start. So, choices. The bane of every adventuring party. Yours can do this in any order, but the order will matter as time ticks on. We'll just pretend mine are going to all of these first, okay? So let's start with the market. The market was a bustling place even at this hour, in its own way. The stalls were being picked apart by shore life, never getting packed up for the day. The party followed the sounds of chitin tearing and strange chanting. They'd understand a prayer to the crab god if they spoke deep speech, but they don't. Robed figures chant around a massive mount of squirming crustaceans in the middle. Their fervor begins to reach a peak, and the pile of pincers begins to bulge as if something huge was moving underneath. If the party acts quick, there's still time to stop them. Okay, let's have a look here. We've got a massive pile of crabs with a circle of cultists and chitinous masks around that. I'm using cultists. You can use crab folk if you want. You can honestly just assign them an HP. They aren't going to fight until the ritual is done, and I doubt they're going to last that long. Add in a cult fanatic or two as their leader, a few feet away from the obvious fireball bait. Guarding the main entrances are swarms of coconut crabs. The cult fanatic will throw spells, but they will not want to get closer. They're focused on the ritual to finish the crab hemoth, a vaguely humanoid monstrosity, its arms tipped in massive claws and two sets of legs emerging from the thick stump of a pelvis. It has no head, its face instead covering the torso, with four smaller limbs emerging from around the mouth. When the ritual ends in three rounds, the crab hemoth will erupt from the crabs. However, if at least half the cultists are slain before then, it starts at half health. Alternatively, have it be at half health round one and recover 20 HP for every round the cultists chant, emerging whenever appropriate. If you need this stronger, try adding more fanatics or giving them better spells. You need it weaker, just remove the fanatic or swap out the crab hemoth for something else. Maybe another owl bear or a troll that's being fed crabs until it becomes one. However you wind up doing it, there's a few things to note in the aftermath. One is that the masks actually seem to be crabs latched onto their faces. Two is that the fanatic wasn't wearing a crab. Their head was the crab. And third, it's hard to make out any clues due to the foot traffic, but the freshest footsteps seem to be coming from the chapel direction, and freshest wagon tracks towards the watchtower. Of course, all of this is assuming they came here first. If not, they'll find the crab hemoth surrounded in unconscious crab folk, dining on the fanatic's body. Not the head, though. That's climbed up on the crab hemoth's back, right between the shoulder blades, where you'd expect the head to be. Since it's their first time seeing the crab hemoth, they might actually think that is the head. That's when they get there, 
Chicago. If they didn't start with the market, they probably started with the Watchtower. It lays on a hill, a cliff by the shore, partially built to signal ships, partially to watch for threats by sea. It was surrounded by rough walls of hewn log. The tides were still rising higher and higher, but it was now obvious that the effect was centered on this tower. They swirled around the normally dry base of the hill and, and somehow kept creeping up it. At their crest, they nearly reached the walls, as if something was drawing them to the twin-pronged plane that seemed to grasp at the stars. Coconut crabs cover the sides, blocking like moths. Slipping through the shadows, Basuki found the inside of the walls were lined with members of the town, tied and gagged. The flames were tended by a cultist, and at their head what seemed to be a massive crab in a hat? No, no, it spoke, and as it turned, she saw the head was once a person's, but the body was that of a hulking crab, rearing backwards on spindly legs. Basuki vanished before I could see her, but the party made themselves known very swiftly. So, in this battle, you have a boss and two Carsonized cult fanatics. As long as the head priest lives, on initiative 20, every medium or smaller creature on the ground must make a DC 15 strength save. On failure, they're pushed 10 feet away from the door by a rushing wave. If you want this fight to be harder, have swarms of crabs drop from the walls and come in with the wave. Or have there just be one fanatic that transforms into a chun as soon as the water touches them. Reflavor it as a crab with a giant sea anemone stuck to their shell. And if you need it easier, just remove a cultist. The priest's honestly not that bad by himself. Once they're free, the villagers will want to rush to their homes or run out of town, but the wounded tavern keep will insist they wait at his shop until the place is cleared out. That is, assuming the heroes are still wanting to help, of course, but tired commoners will just slow them down. If the party wants to know, they're all happy to tell their various and conflicting tales. What's known for certain is that these things snatched people throughout the day, dropping from trees and crawling out of the sea, eventually rounding up anyone who was left in the market. The children were all sent to evacuate or hide, so hopefully they're all still safe. These things really didn't seem that perceptive, so they're probably fine. This is assuming they come here first, of course. If they didn't, the ritual is nearing completion. The cultists are replaced by crabfolk bruisers, and the water is slowly creeping up the walls throughout the fight. Eventually, the townsfolk start to turn into crabfolk. At least if they came here, because they might have gone to the chapel. It stands on the far edge of town. The people here are more superstitious than religious. It's just bad luck to not have some sort of altar to the gods. Especially for one most often used as a graveyard. Strange green light fills the place, flashing out and cracks in the shutters and upper windows. Undead crab occasionally scudding past, but being normal sized means they're not actually a threat. The wizard starts poking at one, fascinated, while the sorcerer tries to crack open a window. They're all fastened shut, however. The only thing he can make out is cruel cackling and muffled chants. The rogue and monk clamber up to the third story window, which they find opens easily. Inside are all the town's children, stuffed into tiny cages or hanging by their ankles. No way they're getting them downstairs and out the door without the hags noticing. Yes, I said hags. Two sea hags and a green hag, to be exact, dancing around a cauldron of horrendous liquid, lit with the wreckages of the altar. They have a hermit crab the size of an elephant, but thankfully it seems to be attempting to hide in the corner. So, sea hags. At least I hope so. They lose half their abilities if you can, though I guess the green hag's invisible might make that hard. <laughs> Seriously, though, their lair action makes all doors and windows in sight magically lock or unlock. If you can pass that DC-20 strength check to pry them open, it's probably not going to be quietly. Thankfully, it only works on ones they can see, so the windows on the second and third floor are still fine. You've also got them still creating their new lair's defenses, but they still have their greatest one. They're part of a coven. That means as long as they're all within 30 feet, they have a shared pool of spells. And the damage off of those is strong. The party has one saving grace. If a dead hag counted as part of the coven, they wouldn't be tolerating each other to begin with. You kill one, they all lose their spellcasting. That said, this can all go bad very quickly. If some of your party has a terrible streak of luck on round one, make the sea hags use their lair action to walk through the walls and run, or have the green hag go invisible and escape. It's the hag thing to do after all. Their plan is basically done already, so they don't really need the other two. And if there's only one left, they get the cool new lair. Whoever's left might even try to make some sort of a deal. But watch out, all of their magic comes at a price. Personally, I'd make their concept of a crab be the cost, but feel free to mess with them however you want. Once they're dealt with, the party can now free the kids upstairs. They won't really have much news to offer, mostly just panicking and crying. Getting them out, calming them down, treating their wounds, etc. might take an hour, so give them that short rest if you like. The kids know the plan was to grow that hermit crab so large they could use the profane chapel as a mobile lair. If you're wondering what changes if the party comes here second, well, it's nothing. I mean, to do that, they would have to completely ignore the main road, cutting through random bits of woods and backyard to completely ignore the town just because, yeah, they probably did that, didn't they? That's players for you. 
Well, you can just have the crab be normal sized and the hags scattered around the building still preparing for the ritual. Anyway, that gives you most of the pieces, but there's still one thing left to do. Take stock your party, and if they need a rest, make sure they have a chance. If your party felt a time crunch, they might not have stopped to rest, and they probably need it before the final battle. If they don't take the opportunity to heal and rest and subscribe and like the video, that's on them. But make sure they at least have a chance before facing the boss. Which boss that is depends on what's left. If they didn't get to the chapel, it's become a massive hermit crab shell, ridden by a green hag as her new lair. She's after the little girl, and the town's children are still in the loft. For some extra challenge, you can have her pop out and fire off vicious mockeries, but she'll flee before she fights if things go bad. And if that's too easy, just add more hags. If they ignored the watchtower, the cult leader marches in with a literal flood, his army of crab folk scuttling through town to drag whoever's left to the sea. Throw in as many crab folk as you need, or condense it down to a couple of bruisers. And if the market was ignored, I'm honestly kind of impressed, but it's time to show them they can't always run from their problems. Give the crab humans some temporary HP, let's say 40, and have the fanatic's head riding on top of it, blasting off spells. Add in some cultists or crab folk as needed, and end this night with a bang. The remaining people are grateful and shower them in what meager funds they have, before the party returns to the countess who sent them on this quest for a far bigger reward. Well, that is if you play it straight. You might remember how I promised advice on how to make this a mystery. Well, here's what you do. Have them go to each of the three locations collecting clues, through writings in the chapel, or rumors on the townsfolk, uh, notes on a body, have them learn all sorts of strange quirks. Like how the cultist master seems to choke when they touch the butter churn. He'll also swap out the chapel encounter entirely. Have it be the hermit crab encounter without the hags. She'll be sneaking out the back invisible while the fight starts. Inside, they'll just find the children upstairs with the body of the old priest. You could have them figure out something with investigation or clues, but there's nobody around who can tell them who did this. I mean, it's not like the kids know what a hag is, and the priest is dead. Um, excuse me, Mr. Priest? Your man, who killed me? They could have a fing wizard. I, I mean, uh, unless they have access to a spell like Speak with Dead. Then they might learn about cruel sisters who wish to flood the town and rule over the crabby inhabitants. Enough to tip off a smart party while remembering that Speak with Dead usually gives cryptic messages. Now, how you handle them finding the hags depends on how well they're doing. You can have them follow her tracks to her lair if they look around the chapel, or maybe they figure out it's a hag and start asking townsfolk, who point them to an old shipwreck that's rumored to be haunted, and there they find the whole coven ready and waiting. If they're stuck, have every crustacean from wood mice to lobsters suddenly start streaming over to their lair. I believe that in most good D&D mysteries, the answer should eventually reveal itself. How well the party did should instead dictate how hard it is to deal with the aftermath. The better the party is at piecing together clues and asking questions, the more weaknesses they'll gather and the easier time they'll have. Perhaps touching garlic makes their tongues swell until they can't cast spells, or their skin starts to boil if they get near a butter churn. Or ignore that route entirely and just have them finding out it's a hag be the mystery. After they've been through all the locations and gathered little hints, they're guided back to the tavern. The poor girl's parents are extremely wounded, but her grandmother has come by to take care of her. It's a disguise that the kid and even the town's spoke or fooled by, but if the party's figured it out, they can stop her before she escapes with the child. And if they don't, well, green hags are all about tragedy. Once she's far out of reach, she'll reveal what's happened, cackling at their suffering and leading to a chase. Or she just gets away. The party won, but not fully. However you do it, I just hope you enjoy the adventure, or at least are inspired to make your own from it. I know my stat sheet isn't exactly pretty, but I hope they get the job done. Also, let me know in the comments if you're into this sort of thing. I'd be happy to make more of these if you're interested. Either way, I'll see you around. Class dismissed. Or they could have a wizard to solve all the